Welcome back to A Case for Cannabis. My name is Alfredo Matthew, the founder of Working World LLC, and I am so excited to be here today with Michael Croft, the owner of Croft Farms. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you very much. Grateful to be here. And would not be, we would not be in Sonoma without having a little wine. What, what, what are we drinking now? This is a Cabernet. Okay. Uh -huh. Salute. Salute. La Strovia. Mm. Love it. We're, we're, we're actually sitting at a winery, and this is a place that's dear to your heart. You grew up in Northern California in the Emerald Triangle, this famous, uh, this famous land. What is so special about the Emerald Triangle? Oh, that's a, that's a bit of a loaded question, but there's yeah. so many special things. Um, all the way from, I would say, the people, which yeah. are a lot, I think there's a different frequency than Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, the open spaces, the redwoods, the wine, um, of course, the cannabis as well. Yeah. You, I mean, just in the little bit of conversation that we've had, you understand plants. You understand horticulture. Uh, what is the microclimate that makes the Emerald Triangle, that makes Mendocino, that makes Humboldt so special? Well, I would say that it's a microclimate that <clears throat> that mimics <clears throat> places where land race cannabis strains came from. Oh. Afghanistan. Um, there's a certain photo period that happens here in Northern California in our latitude that is different than Southern California or Washington. And we are in the sweet spot for microclimates for cannabis growing. And so photo, so, so it's, it's, it's about literally the amount of sun that the plants will get, but isn't it also about humidity and, and, and air and correct. Correct. If you grow in Washington or Oregon outside, there's a lot of rain that comes early. You don't have a steady, you know, warm summer, <clears throat> excuse me. And there are just a lot of different microclimates so if you're a little bit closer to the coast like where my farm is you're going to have a better temperature that produces higher terpenes which is a profile in the cannabis plant and you're going to be susceptible to mold a little closer to the coast but you're going to be having lower temperatures which is better for terpene profile and building thc levels so as we're talking about terpenes and thc levels and all of this there are parallels between the wine industry and the cannabis industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some of the some of the best Pinot Noir is grown where our farm is in Anderson Valley, California. It is a sweet spot of perfect temperature that never ex normally exceeds 90, 95, even on the hottest days. And heat is detrimental to cannabis. Um, when you're exceeding 100 degrees, then you're risking all kinds of problems and you're, you, you're getting higher THC levels, but you're the plant it's, it's bad for the plant. UVs are actually, they're kind of dangerous for the plant. You mm -hmm. want to be able to protect them from with, you know, inland San Juan King Valley is not the most ideal place for growing cannabis. It just gets too hot. Yes. And of course there's so many chemicals in Salinas yes. area, even though it's a wonderful cornucopia of horticulture, there's just chemicals all over the place from some of those big mega food farms. Yeah. So we are, we live in a pesticide free area as well, which is nice about California. And this is the home of the legacy farmer. Yeah. The boutique yeah. farmer, the original growers who are the outlaws, right? I, I mean, you're, you're one of those folks who you didn't just get into this when the legislature passed some kind of, you know, thing that allowed cannabis to become legal in California. This is part of your culture. This is part of what you and, and many of your friends, you've been doing this for decades. We have. And of course it was attractive, you know, in the beginning to be a pioneer in the industry. And I guess you could say that we could risk jail time for what we were doing. And a lot of my friends had been in jail and risked their freedom for their love of the plant. And mm -hmm. something that they believe that wasn't harmful, and which is science has proved that it's not, and it's um, you know it, it was that such that mm -hmm. we were we were pioneers. So, so what do you love about this plant? What what what, what is so 
<laughs> oh God, I'm I'm going to your your passion. Well, your sweet I mean, spot. It, there's so many th- there's so many different things. I mean, you have to think that cannabis could every every on the st- stock drug that's at CVS or the supermarket, it can substitute most all of those Tylenol, um, nausea medicine. Um, you know, it, it goes on, the list goes on. Anxiety. I mean, people, it, it puts, it so could put, cannabis could put literally, if everybody was to use it and believe in it, it could put pharmaceutical companies out of business. Explains a good reason why maybe it has been criminalized and why it has been kept out. I mean, am I far off? Well, <clears throat> the reason why it was criminalized, and I, I'm going to just sidetrack really quick opiates were legal. And they were they were made illegal because people that were working here on our railroads, China, people from China, were, were using the opium poppy for pain relief. It was it was actually made illegal out of racism. Same with the mm-hmm. cannabis plant. They had thought a lot of the Latino workers in the fifties were smoking cannabis, and cannabis was legal, and it was made illegal. I would say out of a racism a long time ago. Most Against ethnic Californians, Correct. the folks who came here, sure. who built California, the Chinese, psychedelics. Mexicans. Psychedelics were legal um, until, you know, hippies were running around the streets on psychedelics. And that those were made illegal out of, I would say, hate to use that word, but against hippies. Yeah. 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 So we know, right, that there's a long history of use of these plants right. by humans, generations past i know hemp was a construction material in the 1800s i mean there's a there's a long history of all this but in the last hundred years we've kind of lost touch with the plant we we've we've lost touch some with this history just like we've lost touch with the land right we just talked a hundred years ago 90 percent of americans were farmers that's right today six percent six percent and probably declining even more yeah um but i think it has been used. It's been used all around the world, even in African tribes. That it's, I mean, it's always been used. But now I think <clears throat> what's happening is the game, and I wouldn't say the game, the industry is changing to a capitalist, sort of a capitalist model. All the people that we were talking about, you know, the small boutique yeah. legacy farmers, they're actually getting pushed out of the game that they believed in and loved the most, which is very unfortunate. So tell me about legacy farming community in California. What is the, what, what is that community like and how is that community under threat with the current kind of economic and climate crisis happening right now? They're like, they're like small towns that believe in sustainable back to the land living towns all over Humboldt County, Mendocino County, Trinity County, people that wanted to have a different lifestyle and they didn't want to live in the city and they believed in what they were doing. So most of the legacy farmers are third generation farmers. Their parents started in the early 60s and it is, it's changing because they are, their risk, their, the risks of trying to grow against capitalist mega farms is it's extraordinarily difficult for them and they're they're getting pushed out and, sy- and systematically and and i feel like there's two things that are driving this one is the market price of the flour correct right because this year there has been such a large supply that the the price has dropped that's right and and, and i also believe that that was designed sort of by the bigger farms because they are they're able to operate as a lo- at a loss until a lot of the smaller farmers are are weeded out and the the problem is is there's a difference between the new growing corporations that are after the money and mm-hmm. then the people that believed in the healing of the plant and the ones that are getting pushed out after yeah. 33 decades of feeding their families and, you know, creating their, creating jobs yeah, for yeah. You know, people as well. So it's not just the 
economic crisis because there is, right, this focus on, you know, big corporations coming into cannabis as it becomes legal in California and many other states and there's pending federal legalization. And once you get to interstate commerce, this whole thing is going to blow up. And if the farmers, legacy farmers, are not able to hang on until then, they won't be able to take advantage of that opportunity when the market really opens up. Well, right. well said. <clears throat> I think that if you have the resilience and the tenacity to hold the line during these times before interstate, because right now in California, we, every, with all the farms, we have enough cannabis for every man, woman, and child, cat and dog, mm-hmm. 10 times. Mm-hmm. And we need, we need, we need the, the doors to open. We need interstate commerce. Yeah. To be able to sell our microclimates, our appellations, and our longtime branding. Yeah. Um, Humboldt County, Mendocino County, Trinity County, they have a long time standing all across the country of producing the best cannabis in the world. Yeah. And so that branding is going to be really important. And you don't want just people coming in who didn't build that brand to get the advantages of that brand. There's also a climate issue. Right. Mm. Water has always been an issue in Uh California. And isn't this issue just getting more challenging? It's getting absolutely challenging. It's I think it should be the biggest fear for even a domestic household going forward. If we do not learn to conserve water um, and stop giving places like the almond fields in the San Joaquin Valley that. You know, one gallon of almond, one gallon per almond. That's what it takes. Mm. Seventeen per, per like one little almond per almond. Seventeen hundred gallons per pound. And seventy five percent of all the almonds grown in San San Joaquin Valley are exported out of country. Mm-hmm. So we're using vast amounts of water for almonds for profit, and that go into you know. Monsanto's pocket, and we're losing. Our, everybody's losing water. My, I have friends that some of their communities seventy five gallons per day in Saint Helena, Hillsburg. Those were the mandatory moratoriums on their water use. You're only is, allowed to use seventy five gallons correct, per day. Correct. With farming totally excluded, that is extremely scary. And if we continue these dry patterns, which I believe we will because I do believe that our climate is changing and I believe that um, every car, every every cow, it systemically is creating to our patterns and our weather dramatically well, I mean, shifting. I'm from New York. I'm not from Northern California. But I know in every way, right, the world knows that Northern California is a place that this is where sustainability came from. Correct. This is where the environment, you know, the, the environmental movement came from here. Right. Right. Uh, farm to table came from here. That's right. You all are the purveyors of a whole lifestyle of a, a back to the land lifestyle. And it feels like just like cannabis is moving from stigma, criminalization to ah, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe, we'll, you know, we'll legalize this. Climate change is also moving from, oh, that's that wacky stuff that those people in California think about. Oh, my God, this is really impacting everyone. Everybody. And water, I mean, what is more essential to life than water? And we're not even fully taking it seriously. I mean, all you have to think about is when Evian water came out years ago, people said, oh, you're buying water? Yeah. And people said, oh, only everybody. But he buys bottled water now. Depending on where you're purchasing it, it can be, and OPEC prices, of course, yes. it can be more expensive than a gallon of gas. Yes. Well, that end is, you know, plastics and, and bringing, uh, you know, uh, plastics and into the water uh, table. Tell me a little bit about your new company, because you're not just a legacy farmer who's, you know, you're all cultivator and you're hanging up and you just live by the old ways. You're actually an entrepreneur and, and an innovator. What is your new company about? Um, it's we're, We are in R&D phase, but it's called Telefarm. 
and a very brilliant professor from Korea named Dr. Lee, Young Hoon Lee. He worked in the medical industry for years, developing sensors and doing different diagnostics for that industry. And one day he had an idea that why can't these sensors, as, as they've been used for doing brain scans, taking blood pressure, detecting cancer, why can't we have this technology monitor plants? to bring smart tech, tech to agriculture. And recently, he, him and his team had flown out from Korea about a couple months ago, and they were so excited to test their technology. It's called SAP Flow technology. In layman's, that is water absorption technology, is how much water the plant takes up. And the, it's a very small microchip sensor that's non-invasive that goes into the stem of the plant and detects the pressure of the water it's uptaking. This technology, I believe, is going to revolutionize farming worldwide mm -hmm. because it gives you the chance to precisely monitor and regulate how much water you give a giant monocrop or a garden in your backyard to save as much water as possible. And the tests have shown we're saving up to 50% water and not affecting any quality or yield of any crop or development of any tree or plant. I mean, you could increase the yield if you actually, right? I mean, I, I, mean, I just have to imagine when I have my plants at home, I kill half of them. I don't really know what they need. I right. probably overwater them. Right. right, And if we have big, large farm systems and we're pushing gallons and gallons and gallons of water into them, you're saying that we could potentially super efficiently irrigate our agricultural fields to preserve water and increase the yield of these plants. Correct. And you did make, you just brought up a funny point, stressing, you're, you're stressing and keep writing the fine line in irrigation delivery for any plant or nut, vegetable, cannabis, grapes especially, writing that fine line actually increases sugar levels and increases yield. But it's there's never been a technology to show how to be able to ride that fine line until now. And now we have it. And, and now so there's opportunities to really use agricultural technologies, ag tech, to really help save this industry, to help grow the industry. Right. You also have a vision for something you're calling autonomous farming. Correct. What, what is autonomous farming? <sighs> the goal for the technology, besides collecting data, and if you're going into battle, data and information, that's the most important thing you have. And when you're growing anything, it's a battle because it's a battle against Mother Nature, pest, disease, you want to have as much data as possible. That's the most wonderful part about these sensors. But the end goal for these sensors is to autonomize farming, to be able to have the sensors control the irrigation. Telefarm's true vision is to be able to decrease monocropping, giant farms, and empower backyard farming, mm -hmm. front yard farming, Turning your front yard into a beautiful, aesthetic, food-producing operation that autonomously grows itself. So I, so I won't have to. I won't be killing my own. You won't nest. have to water the, the the sensors. Will they will build their own algorithm and deliver the water perfectly accordingly? And you, it's a hands-off thing. All you'll have to do is go out and cut your food. Cut my food. Oh, that sounds good to me. And the app will show you ex precisely when it's ready. So, so, I, so I can check. I can check my phone. Right. I can monitor to see. Hey, they're doing pretty great, right? Every, everyone is is thirsty. Right? They're all getting their needs met. It's gonna. I'm gonna have harvest in three days. Right. Or the app will tell you that the sugar levels are optimal two days prior or later then you think they're going to be available. I see. That it's going to be ready for harvest, yes. Um, now, just explain this to me because I'm not, a, I'm not a, a horticulturalist. 
what is the problem with these monocrop, large monocrop uh, systems? <sighs> well, mono, it would, I would say it's monocrop farming. I mean, I'm not going to throw Monsanto under the bus here, but um, giant, f- giant ag doesn't have love in it. We were talking earlier that 90% of Americans were farmers in the yeah. early 1900s. Food grown with love, um, no pesticides. When you grow anything, especially cannabis, on a, on a large scale, the quality degrades. Yes. And the love is not in the food, the grapes, the wine, the cannabis, the watermelons. Everything that's done on a smaller scale has... It's craft. It's 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 done. It's customized. There's care. Correct. There's there's a story. There's a community behind it. Right. And that I think is one of the biggest biggest challenges facing this industry because you have so many people who want to be a part of this industry because they love it. And but the problem is, it's a capital intensive industry. The regulations and the compliance are very very expensive. And so one of the challenges I see is how are all these small retailers, how are these small manufacturers, how are these small cultivators going to compete against these larger, you know, vertically, vertically integrated corporates? I would say that's a great question for the consumer and being able to teach the consumers that, you know, if you buy, if you buy a farmer's market, you're going to have a better, better tasting broccoli. If you're buying small craft cannabis, you're going to have a better quality product that you smoke or or ingest. Um, wine, smaller vineyards. Kendall, I'm not going to think bigger vineyards. The, the wine's not as good. So it's teaching the consumer that you know the smaller, you know, is, is smaller. The smaller the operation, the better the food, wine, or cannabis. And I guess that leads me to my next question: is is how do we attract young people to be growers to get into the industry to get into cannabis industry to be grape growers to grow food yeah and and i it, i wonder that all the time like how how was how do we make it attractive how do we how do we make it cool to be yeah. a farmer well that is a one i mean this is part of what it is is opening up opportunities for people to touch the soil and touch the plants this morning we were interviewing President Chung and and uh, and Dr. Selu over at Santa Rosa Junior College, who have a hemp horticultural cultivation. They have shown farms. They have like an amazing facility, and the community colleges are getting more involved in cannabis education and thinking through pathways. But in your mind, you're part of a generation that embraced this industry. You were doing it. But you're, are you kind of thinking about who do we pass the torch to? Absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, if, of course, you know, cannabis has been demonized for so long. Oh, it's, it has this giant, you know, stigma attached to it. And it's, there shouldn't be. There's alcohol is actually, looking at the wine here, it's more, <clears throat> it can cause more problems in your life than cannabis. Cannabis is one of the most, honorable professions you could possibly get into and especially if you could we could find new breeders that can breed new phenotypes if you could develop a new strain that nobody has then that would be extraordinary there's still so many wonderful frontiers in our industry to get into i would say to any small I mean, to any small college that is going to do to teach classes, to teach them, to teach how tissue culture, to teach cannabis retail, to teach cannabis extraction, to teach all parts of the industry. I think that would be wonderful if they started teaching classes and getting young people into. Well, I think that there's a demand, right? There is definitely a demand. There is. And colleges have to play a role in meeting the needs of the, the consumer. And right. the consumer are, are the, the working people in California, folks who want to, you know, kind of shift careers and find more purpose and find more meaning. And sometimes it's, you know, getting back to the land and, and, sure. and, and doing farming. Or maybe not doing farming because that farming, you know, doesn't have to be done like it was 100 years ago. Now you can be using technology. Correct. You can be a technician. Correct. You can be inventing technology that is improving horticulture. And I do see tech 
being a huge, it already is on a lot of massive farms, but I do see technology becoming a huge component in the future with horticulture. I think that we are going to be seeing, besides, <clears throat> there's one thing I don't, you know, condone is crossing pesticides into crops. But using, using tech, using IT, using artificial intelligence, AI mm -hmm. to to help us you know have our own little farms everywhere and I think it's coming and being able to you, you know half the world more than half the world I would say loves their smartphone how neat would it be to be able to control your garden through your smartphone instead of you know just being addicted to, to social media absolutely yeah. and you know it's it, there's and then of course you get to eat it at the, at the end of the day and, and have it nourish you and yeah i yeah. think that hopefully that young people are going to be more interested in growing anything in the future because we are losing farmers and the interest in it all the time all right so i'm getting another sense of urgency mm -hmm. we, we we have to connect people back to their food we have to connect people back to the land sure we're only you know, one generation away, maybe two generations away from, from all being farmers, right, from having that connection. Um, but that's something really important. Where is this industry going in the next three to five years, and what is your hope, right? What is your hope for where potentially this industry can go? My hope is that once it gets federally legalized and we have interstate, that... <sighs> Small craft farms will have a place at the table. Mm. Just the same as any of the biggest corporations, that, that they will have a seat at the table to share their product and so that people can know the difference. Is there an association of small craft farmers, cannabis farmers in California? There is. There are. There is, there's quite a few of them. And there's a lot of them are starting to grow, to stick together, make alliances instead of... You know, you yeah. don't you don't want to describe the water when you're drowning, but a lot yeah. of them are. Yeah. And so in, a lot of them are getting together, uniting, building strong bonds to say, hey, we're collectively growing together. So if we all collectively stick together and we have 500 farms, yeah. then we're bigger than this, the biggest the other cannabis corporation that's all by themselves. Yeah. And I'm hoping that Sun Grown Cannabis will always, you know... Have a place. Have a place. Because, you know, there's indoor cannabis looks wonderful, but would you raise your kids under artificial light? Yeah. Would you want to live under artificial light instead of the sunlight? I mean, there's nothing better than the sun. And, espe and especially all the things that are grown under it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well that is truly beautiful. And that is a big vision and that is a lot of work. So, Michael, I really hope that this slap, sap flow technology takes off. I hope that you and your friends, the other legacy farmers, are able to hold on and be resilient and see this kind of next change. And, um, you know, I just really thank you for your time today. Thank you. To all the young farmers out there, growing is cool. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Right. And let's just cheers to that. Cheers. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Salute. Salud.